Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today is episode 111, and I couldn't be more excited to introduce you to our guest. He is Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Alexander is currently best known as the New York Times best-selling author of Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, and The Map of Heaven, How Science, Religion, and Ordinary People Are Proving the Afterlife. He is also co-founder of the nonprofit organization Eternia and is passionate about the audios of sacred acoustics, which I'm excited to learn more about. Today, he will share some details and lessons learned from his near-death experience and his journey over the last eight years, including about consciousness, science, and spirituality, and the power of unconditional love. Dr. Eben Alexander, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Well, Sandra, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm super delighted, just super delighted. I am a big fan of your books. I, I purchased them both on audio and you've been with me quite a bit and my journey's in the car and so just to connect with you voice to voice is really special yes yeah so thank you first of all for sharing your journey so publicly i think you're in oh gosh over 40 countries your books published something yes. like that right yes yeah and that you continue not just sharing your experience but you continue your quest to help people believe in the afterlife and, and gain research and that you share. So I really want to thank you for all you continue to do. Well, thanks. Yeah. So would it be all right if you just start out with a little bit of your journey? Because uh, some, many of our listeners know exactly who you are and they're thrilled that you're the guest today, but some have never heard of you. So maybe just a, some of your background and, and what happened to you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, basically, I grew up in a fairly conventional scientific household. My father, who was very influential in my life, uh, was the chairman of a neurosurgical training program. So he was deeply into science, physics, cosmology, chemistry, neuroscience, uh, all of that. He um, was totally into it. But also he had grown up uh, the son of a general surgeon who was very religious and took him to their Presbyterian church every day when he was younger. Um, and for my father, there was never any conflict between knowing the reality of, of God and um, with his scientific pursuits. Now, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and like many others who grew up in that era, of course, I always knew that science is the pathway to truth. I'm more of a scientist now than I've ever been. Uh, but it turns out that the experience I had in November of 2008, which was an extremely severe case of gram-negative bacterial meningitis, the worst kind of meningitis you can have, uh, which absolutely should have killed me. I was down to a 2% chance of survival by the end of the week. And, and that 2% chance only included coming back uh, basically to never wake up and just be in a coma for a few months and die. And then I did come back to this world. But my brain, as my doctors had predicted, was destroyed. I mean, the neocortex had been badly wrecked, but it came back extremely rapidly, inexplicable recovery over hours, days, weeks, so that by eight weeks after coma, um, all of my memories had returned and then some. And it, it completely violated everything that I had come to know uh, because I had worked as a neurosurgeon in academic circles. I followed in my father's footsteps, uh, taught neurosurgery as an associate professor at Harvard Medical School for more than 15 years. Wow. So I thought I'd been closing in on some kind of idea of how brain, mind, and consciousness are interrelated. Uh, and yet uh, the deep reality, and this of course is something that uh, much of the world needs to come to know as we move forward with all this, is that our conventional neuroscientific model that tries to explain uh, the physical being all there is and the brain as a physical structure that gives rise to consciousness out of physical matter, all of our belief in that assumption uh, has, has been devastated by the evidence to the contrary. When you find out 
uh, the millions and millions of data points of people who had near-death experiences, shared death experiences, which are qualitatively similar, but occur in physiologically normal people, usually bystanders at the bedside, but they could be thousands of miles away when the loved one passes over. Uh, things like telepathy, precognition, uh, presentiment, uh, past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation. I mean, there's a tremendous category of uh, kind of experiences in consciousness, uh, reports by the millions that completely defies our simplistic and what I would say false uh, conventional view of modern scientific materialism that the physical is all there is and that the brain creates consciousness out of physical matter. In fact, no one on earth has ever been able to follow up with that supposition with any kind of a statement about the mechanism that links the physical brain to consciousness. In fact, uh, many modern investigators who get deeply into this, people like, for example, Christoph Koch, who uh, is a renowned uh, neuroscientist who's the head of the Paul Allen a brain science center in, in Seattle. Christoph Koch wrote in his autobiography, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist, a few years ago, that he had abandoned all hope of trying to explain consciousness as uh, a result of physical brain processes. And this is where I would say all of the great students of the mind-body discussion end up going sooner or later because there's nothing at all in the simplistic uh, materialist uh, model, the physicalist model within science, that the physical is all that exists, there's just no way to get there. And so uh, what, the, what these near-death experiences and uh, similar uh, kind of anomalies, all the white swans out there, uh, that defy the evidence of the conventional materialist scientific model, um, you know, the materialist scientists have been just denying these realities for a very long time. They deny the experience. They just say, well, it's a hallucination. Right. But in fact, that is wrong. Once you get into the literature and, and talk to people and really get in these experiences, you realize they're much more real than our everyday version of common consensus reality in the material world. Mm. Uh, so these are very important. Could you give a little example of that? Because the man who's speaking right now was not the man who existed prior to November 2008, I believe. Weren't you somebody who um, believed that these might be illusions of the brain, these near death right. Well, I just dismissed them because, and I, I was basically being slave to my, my theoretical model. Right. You're slave to a false theoretical model. You're just basically setting yourself up for endless frustration. Yeah, that's, that's what why, we do as human yeah. beings. That's what so, we do. Yeah, it was a complete shift. I mean, because, yes, before my coma, I, I paid no attention whatsoever to the near-death literature yeah. because I knew uh, that the brain creates consciousness. That's an assumption that right. had been drilled into me all those years. And, of course, we keep finding exceptions to that and pieces of evidence that say, wait, that's wrong, that's false. And my, um, my personal journey deep in coma is a perfect example of such an of such an experience that absolutely tips over our simplistic and false materialist view of the universe. Mm. Uh, and so, really, what I had to do was wrestle down and try to come to an understanding of it. Um, initially, as you, as you can see from uh, reading Proof of Heaven, looking at the appendix to Proof of Heaven with the nine hypotheses that I entertained with uh, colleagues who were interested in consciousness and trying to explain my experience, uh, you end up realizing that uh, everything that we thought we've known about consciousness and this kind of fundamental belief that the physical world is all that exists is uh, just the tiniest little piece of the puzzle, but all these other pieces of evidence of near-death experiences and the ultra-real encounters that people have often with souls of departed loved ones who they may not have even known at the time of their experience had died yet, and yet, that is uh, kind of the filter. That's who we uh, usually encounter on the other side right. are the souls of those who left the physical plane. And I think if, if the world were really privy to the complete ignorance of our conventional neuroscience about trying to explain consciousness, they would realize this is a wide open field and to shut it down with some uh, fra false presupposition and assumption such as, the physical is all that exists, 
and the physical brain must therefore create this thing called consciousness that we can even even label as an illusion or to say isn't even real, which is what some scientists try to say. Whereas, in fact, the truth of the matter is the only thing any human being has ever known is the inside of their own consciousness. Right. So if we're going to come up with any kind of a theory of everything, we damn well better have a much clearer view of the relationship of brain and mind and how this beautiful, elaborate uh, illusion, what uh, we often call the supreme illusion in our presentations, uh, you know, that all of the out there is out there, uh, but that is an illusion. When humans experience is an internal construct, a model of what is supposed to be out there. And, of course, we all assume it's a very faithful model to reality, but physicists have been telling us for a very long time that physics is not about understanding reality. It's about making predictive models to try and predict how things will occur in this, in this world of ours. Wow. And so... Uh, we really got to, you know, quit letting the tail wag the dog and get back to a point where we realize the consciousness uh, is the fundamental mystery and we've got to come up with a much richer understanding of consciousness and how our conscious uh, perceptions relate to that, quote, physical reality, unquote, that we presume to be out there. And, of course, the findings within the world of quantum physics are what completely open the door to real, true free will and the fact that consciousness is fundamental in the universe. And yet the physics community has struggled for more than 115 years trying to make any kind of reasonable sense of the results of quantum mechanical experiments. And so this is one of the things we're wrestling with now is trying to move as a culture beyond uh, those lessons because, in fact, most of the scientific community has not yet even really fully incorporated the lessons of quantum physics, right. uh, because they can't come to any kind of agreement about the interpretation of the measurement problem, the, the role of the observer, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's where many modern physicists have simply gotten very lost. Yes. I want to just ask you a question. Um, let me back up just for a quick second. You and I were both at an extraordinary place called the Omega Center over the past week uh, for different uh, lectures and things, but I picked up a magnet in their gift shop, and it said, don't believe everything you think. I, and I thought that was just speaking to what you're speaking about. You know, we're so s very often stuck in what our beliefs are. Right. And I think you, like me, it's like, let's look outside of our thoughts, outside of our experience, uh, that, that there is a bigger picture. But my question, Dr. Alexander, is um, what, could you give us just a couple of examples of things that you experienced in coma that when you started reliving it and sharing your story that really touched you that there's no doubt that there's got to be something else. Well, I mean, for one thing, the entire experience that I had that I described in Proof of Heaven, according to my beliefs before coma, my neuroscientific beliefs, could never have happened. None of it could have happened at all because the neocortex is the most powerful calculator in the human brain, and it's part that uh, all of our conventional neuroscience would say that that neocortex must be involved for any kind of detailed representation of a consciousness uh, model, you know, of, of any kind of detailed conscious awareness, that neocortex is clearly participating tremendously. And yet my doctors knew that um, based on my neurologic exams, based on my diagnosis and the clinical path that I followed and how sick I was over just a few hours, they knew that my neocortex wasn't participating in anything. It wasn't there to provide any kind of dream or hallucination or drug effect confabulation. None of that was possible because of the destruction to the neocortex. So really, all of the experience was a violation of some of the cardinal principles of our current neuroscience and belief in physicalism. Now, of course, those who read the book Proof of Heaven will realize, especially uh, how I finished that book and my own revelation that occurred four months after my coma that, to, that still sends shivers up and down my spine when I, uh, excuse me, uh, up and down my spine whenever I consider any aspect of it had to do with the identity of that beautiful girl on the butterfly wing. Uh, and to me, that uh, that is just the loveliest possible way the universe could keep reminding me 
of the power of that journey, the fact that it completely violated everything I believed before, and in fact, a beautiful and loving invitation from the universe for me to awaken to a far grander understanding of who I am, who humans are, what we're doing here, what this existence is all about, brings tremendous sense of purpose and uh, of meaning uh, to life. And uh, in fact, this is why I think near-death experiences are so important is not that they, not because they, uh, you know, is kind of a natural effect, uh, bring us a knowing of the eternity of souls and that our interconnectedness with other souls is eternal and that death of the physical body is only that, death of the physical body. It's not the end of those relationships. It's not the end of our evolution as souls on soul journeys and soul groups. Uh, It's a much more beautiful and complete understanding of of the nature of reality and of what we're doing here as human beings and and very much enlivens the idea of the soul and of our soul connections and i came back seeing that the only important thing is that unconditional love uh you know people bandy that term around a whole lot and have for many many uh millennia and yet the reality is that deep and profound unconditional love of that creator for the creation is something that uh, millions have come to experience through various types of spiritually transformative experiences. Once you touch that, feel that, know that, uh, it changes your life forever. And that's why so many millions who have had near-death experiences realize there's absolutely nothing to fear about death of the physical body. In fact, it's an adventure, it's an awakening to a much higher awareness. Because, in fact, our normal waking consciousness in the brain is really a consciousness that I, I often say is from a uh, prison. The brain is uh, like a, a shackles. It's, uh, we are contained within that prison of thinking of the here and now as the ultimate reality. In fact, we're far bigger and grander than that. That's why I'm such a huge fan of meditation, which is exactly what my uh, partner Karen Newell and I were doing at Omega Institute uh, a weekend or so ago. Uh, was helping to share with others um, meditative techniques that we found to be very powerful. Now, first and foremost, I just recommend to people go within. The answers lie within us all. That's something I made very clear in the appendix to my second book, The Map of Heaven, which is entitled The Answers Lie Within Us All. And it's all about that kind of thing. So silencing the little voice in our head, realizing the voice in our head is not our consciousness. Our consciousness is the observer. It's the awareness. That observer awareness part of our consciousness is the part that is so absolutely mind-numbing. That's the part that right at the core of what's called the hard problem of consciousness, one of the deepest enigmas known to all of modern scientific thought, which is basically trying to relate the, the physical brain to mental processes and consciousness. That hard problem is so challenging because from a purely physicalist viewpoint, it, it's impossible. It's not only a hard problem, I would say it's impossible. That's why it looks so challenging. But by opening our minds to a much greater possibility, that is the consciousness is fundamental in the universe, that our very consciousness is a, a small local reflection of that infinite universal consciousness. And that the brain is not serving as the producer of consciousness, but actually as a reducing valve or filter that limits our conscious awareness down to this tiny little trickle. And that is kind of the scientific view that is taking this world by storm. And I would say within the next decade or two, you won't find a single, uh, you know, kind of well-read, intelligent, well-informed modern thinker who denies of the reality of eternal consciousness and that our consciousness is not created by the brain at all. I mean, it's something that, to me, it's one of the biggest smoke and mirrors tricks of all of 20th and early 21st century science is that people still buy into that simplistic notion that the physical is all that there is, that the brain creates consciousness out of physical matter, and that our existence is birth to death and nothing more. Uh, All of that thinking will go the way of, oh, the earth is flat, or oh, the sun goes around the earth. Right. Well, guess what? Uh, we're rapidly moving to a point where no, no one will continue to doubt the reality 
of soul and of spirit and of the divine and of consciousness is fundamental in the universe because the evidence is all around us. That is so exciting to hear. And it just reminds me of a quote that you might or may or may not have heard of. Our lifetime is but a thread in the fabric of our souls. Well, I would say I've often used the analogy, it's like a beautiful tapestry. Yes. And all of this is a beautiful tapestry, and that tapestry involves, you know, too numerous to count souls involved in this beautiful dance together of learning and teaching and growing together. It's what we've been doing all along. This is not just about humans. It's not just about life on Earth. It's a much bigger uh, kind of tapestry than that. And we are all part of that beautiful interwoven tapestry. Yeah, and we don't need to have a near-death experience to access it. Exactly. And that's why Karen and I love going around and giving workshops to help share the tools of sacred acoustics. Now, so I was mentioning a minute ago, whatever technique you have for going within and, and acknowledging that, that little voice in your head, which I would say is the linguistic brain that's tightly tied to ego, the little voice in the head, of course, ego has two main tools. It uses fear and anxiety to try and drive you. Um, but that little voice is not your consciousness, as we said a minute ago. And so going within uh, is a beautiful way in meditation uh, to recognize that voice as it is. I, I love how Michael Singer labels that voice in the book, Untethered Soul. He calls the voice in our head our annoying roommate. That's I a love that. beautiful term because that's exactly right. The annoying roommate. And remember, that annoying roommate, the linguistic brain and ego, um, is also a major part of kind of our rational, logical thought system. Uh, and all of our modern science and philosophy is kind of based in this communication with our linguistic brain. But this is, again, you're not going to think your way into knowing the kind of things I know and the proof of the afterlife. You have to find it by mainly by going within. Now, you can learn a lot from, uh, you know, reading the books, watching the DVDs, going to the presentations. But at the end of the day, to truly know the deepest answers, we must go within. And that's why uh, we encourage people, if you don't have a good means of going within and deep meditation and coming to a deeper inner truth and silencing that little voice of anxiety and the ego – but actually learning that you have far greater wisdom of guidance within, um, then the tools of sacred acoustics can help people get there because we use differential sound frequency to entrain the brain to a very uh, kind of fundamental levels of, of low frequencies mainly down in delta and theta ranges uh, to help people escape the here and now. And we, we explain some of that in that appendix to uh, Map of Heaven uh, that appendix entitled The Answers Lie Within Us All, I explained some of what's going on with these uh, differential sound frequency brain entrainment. Uh, the generic term is often binaural beats, but sacred acoustics uses a lot more than just simple binaural beats in terms of helping to set conscious awareness free from the shackles of the physical brain. I love it. And just before uh, I called you, I went to sacredacoustics.com and I just felt guided to download Know Yourself. Uh, I don't know that's why that one. Of my favorites. <laughs> oh, cool. There's lots to, to choose from. And I totally get it because uh, you don't know me so well, but some of our listeners do. I've been on that journey to quiet the mind and uh, I've taken mediumship courses and just things that I never thought were possible uh -huh. are, are possible. And it all lies within the quiet mind. It does. So I'm really excited to listen more to Know Yourself after we're done talking. But where do we start? If, I mean, that, that website's, I don't want to say overwhelming, but there's lots to choose from. And if we are interested in taking the first step to whether it's knowing ourselves or having that journey within, would it be like knowing Know Yourself or uh, something well, else? Well, I, I would... Um I think if you spend a little more time on her site, you will see um, she's been working on some uh, videos recently, some training videos to offer for free to people to help uh, really get people up to speed on this. Um, and there, I, I've seen several of these videos. Uh, I think she's doing a fantastic job of getting it out there. But in other words, so that when you go to the Sacred Acoustic site, uh, spend a little more time on it, and you'll find that there's some organization there. She has some recommended 
uh, bundles, which, you know, depending on what you're doing, are you looking for creativity? Right. Are you looking to journey? Are you looking for soul guidance? Are you looking connect to, to connect with the souls of departed loved ones? Uh, are you looking to invent something new? Or, um, you know, there are many different ways for going within. It's extremely valuable for health, for personal health, and for manifesting the power of prayer for the health of others. Mm. Uh, so it really depends kind of on what people are looking for. And many people, of course, are just looking to journey. They want deeper guidance. They want to explore their own consciousness. Uh, and there's several in there. I would say just as a general recommendation uh, for people who are getting started, uh, probably an excellent starting point on sacredacoustics.com is that Foundation 2 series, which is actually eight separate 39-minute uh, exercises, four of them guided, verbally guided, but the verbal guidance is minimal. It's only at the beginning because uh, anytime we're using verbal guidance, we're kind of dragging uh, awareness back into the physical brain and the linguistic brain, and we're actually trying to escape all that in the long run. That's why all of the uh, sacred acoustics offerings come with as both a guided version with a little verbal guidance at the beginning to kind of uh, set the stage for people and to help them. And then the same set of tones uh, as an, a nonverbal version. So in other words, the general idea being that you graduate from the verbal version to using a nonverbal. And in fact, these uh, sound meditations in many ways are just training wheels because what you find is, for example, I try to meditate an hour or two a day. I've been doing that for the last six years, wow. and it just gets better and better. And your abilities, you know, all the abilities that initially I could only access deep in a meditative state, over time they start becoming more and more uh, available to you so that even in your normal waking consciousness, not listening to tones, not in deep meditation, you can end up accessing some of the mental capacities you have deep in meditation. So the, these tones will change you over time and help your soul journey, help one grow. But, of course, it does take putting in the work. You don't do this five or ten times and then say, well, I don't think it's working for me. Just forget about it. No, uh, it's a really commitment. It's like work. building a muscle that you just exactly. practice, practice, practice. And I know from myself, not that I've used sacred acoustics yet, but taking that journey inward, I have had visions dr alexander that were more real than waking life and i thought wow what the heck is that exactly. and so you start having some experiences <laughs> and you want more you want to know what it is and also for my daily life i find you know that voice inside our head can be so loud and so negative but the more meditation um it's like it's quiet more quiet on a daily basis right and then i have great ideas i have answers that just spring to mind i believe that's what we can tap into our yes. soul and, and connect that way um great. could you tell us a little bit about what eternia is well eternia is really the brainchild of my good friend john audette john audette was one of the co-founders of IANDS, that is International Association of Near-Death Studies, back in the mid-1970s. Uh, it was people like Raymond Moody, Bruce Grayson, Ken Ring, and John Audette who founded uh, IANDS because they thought that near-death experiences were so extraordinary that they would help change this whole world for the better. So uh, that's what they started was that particular group, and John was part of it all. Um, over time, he... Uh, uh, kind of, I think he became somewhat disillusioned. He was very much, John is a beautiful idealist. Uh, you know, he has a wonderful idea and vision for where the world should be, a world based in love and harmony and peace and compassion. Um, and uh, so anyway, when he heard me talk, I told my story to the IONS group at their annual meeting of Labor Day weekend, uh, uh, back in 2011, so just five years ago right now, and he was there, and uh, I think that when he heard my story, he realized that we were now at uh, kind of this major reboot in terms of the mission of IONS, and he thought that now really the energy is there to change the world. Um, and so I kind of uh, spent time with him at that meeting um, and heard about some of his ideas for eternity, attorney up. It really, in, in my view, is a beautiful uh, mission to help change this world. Eternia, if people visit the website, E-T-E-R-N-E-A dot org, Eternia dot org, 
uh, you'll find that it is several things. Uh, first and foremost, it's a beautiful um, um, information site for people who want to learn more about the physics of consciousness, how quantum mechanics is important in this deeper understanding. In fact, uh, Eternia initially uh, was kind of uh, an adopted child of uh, Edgar Mitchell and his uh, Quantrek site. Uh, Edgar Mitchell, of course, the Apollo 14 astronaut, uh, just an absolutely wonderful human being who had that beautiful epiphany uh, during the Apollo 14 mission back in uh, uh, February of 71, coming back from the moon where he realized the entire universe is conscious. And so uh, he came back to this world and started IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences out in California. Um, and Edgar Mitchell then went on to spend uh, the rest of his life right up until February of this year being a, a wonderful spokesman for the reality of kind of this uh, union of science and spirituality based in the findings of quantum mechanics and based in some of these deep spiritual journeys having to do with consciousness is fundamental in the universe. Um, and so uh, I met Edgar Mitchell through John Audet, uh, their close friends, and uh, that's really how Eternia got going. So it serves as a repository for information for the public about the physics of consciousness and a deep understanding of how science and spirituality are coming together, but also it serves as a beautiful repository where people with... Uh, spiritually transformative experiences of all types, and they're defined quite well on that Eternia website, but people who have had uh, after-death communications or past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation, uh, other past life uh, memories, uh, precognition, pre-sentiment, all the huge list, uh, um, telepathy, um, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, etc., all well-defined on that attorney.org website, and then also people are invited to leave their own stories, tell their stories there. And they're done in such a way that uh, experts in those various fields, scientists who study telepathy or study near-death experiences, uh, can then have access to those reports. We want to use it as a major database to help bring this world up to the next level. So uh, working with attorney has been a real joy for me, although my personal work, uh, has remained very strong and has not allowed me to just spend time fully uh, working just uh, on attorney projects and things like that. And that's where we've had some beautiful people come in, uh, like Gary Schwartz uh, from University of Arizona in Tucson um, and, and many others, Irvin Laszlo recently uh, aligning with the Laszlo Institute and uh, the Club of Budapest with Eternia.org for some of their shared missions of educating this world and taking the world to the next level. So Eternia uh, is really a work in progress to help wake this world up. It's so refreshing to hear you say this because even uh, my book came out three years ago and I was petrified that people would think I was an absolute lunatic, that I was one of these airy-fairy psychic people for being in the conversation of life after death. And Dr. Alexander, it is so refreshing to hear you speak because for me, and probably for some of our listeners, it builds confidence that, hey, it's not just airy fairy psychic people that are talking life after death we have quantum physicists we have astronauts we have a neurosurgeon with 25 years experience we have doctors scientists just all these people in the field of consciousness right well as i said uh, a little while ago give it a decade or so and there will be no serious self-respecting quote scientist unquote out there who will deny the reality of the evidence for the afterlife and eternity of soul uh, in fact, to me, one of the most beautiful surprises of all this has been the engineers, the chemists, the doctors, the nurses, uh, the scientists of all sorts who come out of the woodwork thanking me for proof of heaven and the map of heaven because, in fact, they, they find it a refreshing uh, view that leads towards a worldview that makes sense, that we can synthesize science and spirituality in a very rich sense and make a far deeper a statement about the notion of consciousness and of purpose and meaning to our existence here only by opening our minds to accept all of these truths and this much bigger vision of who we are. And in fact, I would say there's no way out for materialist science. Materialist science 
head in this headstrong rush to try and demonstrate that clockwork universe postulated 400 years ago at the advent of the scientific revolution well what quantum physics keeps telling us is there is no clockwork universe nothing exists independent of the observing mind and so admitting the prime primacy of consciousness is absolutely essential uh, and until they can even do that uh, they're stuck and a perfect example is trying to answer the measurement problem uh, in quantum mechanics which uh, if you're stuck in the purely physicalist uh, mindset of brain creates consciousness you're never going to get anywhere and that's why they will just be increasingly frustrated and that's why I love groups like the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies the people who wrote uh, Irreducible Mind and Beyond Physicalism, two wonderful scientific books that go a long way towards uh, what I would say is the much deeper truth of our existence. But you have to leave that simplistic falsehood of scientific materialism uh, in the in the rearview mirror because it is a dead end. It doesn't help us get anywhere close to truth. And that's why this is a way forward for all of humanity, uh, is opening our minds to a much richer understanding of the nature of consciousness and in in that pathway coming to know that we are eternal spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe that all the material aspect is just the stage setting on which that beautiful drama is to unfold but the reasons for the universe are for the sentient beings to learn and teach these lessons we're here to learn and the lesson Currently, and I, when I say currently, I mean for the last many thousands of years, uh, challenging to be learned by uh, humanity is that lesson of love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, mercy, that uh, we are still a long way from really getting. But I believe that the awakening I see coming to this world now over the next decade is an awakening that leads us strongly uh, into a much a uh, richer answer to all that question and understanding of the nature of existence. But it will be admitting the, the primary role of consciousness in all of this universe. Even, the, you know, the Big Bang and the whole observable physical universe is but an emergent piece of all of consciousness, which is far greater than that. That's mind-blowing. And even looking in my house right now, just thinking it's all an illusion. Like you say, it's, it's, for the, it's a stage set for, well, I call it my soul. But it's, it's crucial to point out, uh, illusion, I don't like the word illusion okay. uh, because it implies that it's unimportant, you know, but it's, it's very important. In fact, I would say the whole universe, the bigger, grander universe exists to support this very stage setting and illusion to provide the ground for soul school. This is where we're here to learn and teach. But we can only do it if we're partially veiled from the fuller knowing that our higher souls can have between lives. But crucial to point out, that higher uh, soul between lives does not have infinite knowledge. Uh, this is all about gaining knowledge and information and about growth of the universe, of a self-realizing and self-aware universe. Uh, and we're all part of that. Uh, in fact, I think the holographic principle is a great way to put it. You know, in a hologram, the whole uh, is reflected in each of the parts and vice versa. And likewise, each and every one of us is kind of a holographic uh, presentation of the entire universe. And so what we're going through personally in our pathway of discovery is very much like the evolution of all of consciousness throughout the universe, kind of along the lines of Teilhard de Chardin and what he wrote about. But it's, uh, we're all part of that process, and that includes those who are not very awake. Uh, they are part of the learning and teaching of uh, all of this. Hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because I know there's people in my life that think I'm a, a nut job. Like, go do what you're doing, Sandra. It's not my thing. But how, And I always just thought, well, they're a young soul or <laughs> something well, like that. How do they apply in my spiritual growth or any well, of ours because we all have these people in our life. Well, I would say there are young souls and there are old souls and there's everything in between and kind of a general litmus test for those would be how self-centered someone is. Someone who's very egotistical, selfish, greedy, self-centered is a very young soul. Someone who is very philanthropic, altruistic and only concerned with the good of all the world and of all players uh, that's, uh, in my mind, a, a relatively older soul. But I would say we all play a role. And it's really this beautiful dance with 
advanced souls and less advanced souls and learning and teaching and coming to, uh, you know, kind of buy into this, quote, illusion, buy into this four-dimensional space-time and enough that we have skin in the game that we end up, uh, if we succumb to it, we even believe that we have one life to live, birth to death, nothing more, and, and then feel the pain even more acutely by not having that uh, beautiful vision that we come back again and again and our soul groups reincarnate together to progressively uh, learn and teach and to grow together towards that oneness with the divine. But uh, it's all a beautiful one. Mm. Uh, to me, the phrase, all is well, says it all. It does. This is the way it's supposed to be. And we're supposed to be here to learn and teach. Uh, I would say it's a beautiful uh, ground for the discussion of the whole notion of free will. Because the conventional materialist science that I worshipped before my coma very proudly said that since consciousness was only an illusion of the physical uh, workings of subatomic particles, atoms, molecules of the brain, and nothing more, that of course we did not have free will because the subatomic particles in all those brain cells are simply following natural laws. And uh, so they would look at uh, consciousness as a complete illusion. I came to see that they had it completely backwards. I had it completely backwards before. Consciousness is fundamental. The brain and all the physical world is emergent from consciousness. So uh, it's, it's just a much bigger viewpoint that allows uh, for a lot more explanation of some of these exotic phenomena. But, of course, the recoil comes from people who are very addicted to their simplistic beliefs in pure scientific materialism. And it's so simple, they even say, well, we've almost got a theory of everything. Although Stephen Hawking was smart enough back in September 2010 in Scientific American to put out an article that basically said, well, guess what, folks? We have to settle for two or more theories of everything. Uh, and, of course, we should all know there is one truth. There is one universe. And any time you're seeing multiple theories of everything is necessary to explain it all, that should tell you that uh, um, elements of some of your theories are not at all approaching truth, and they will end up being rejected. In fact, we find that when you combine quantum physics and relativity, the two most proven scientific theories of the 20th century, uh, they don't mix at all. In fact, they give nonsensical answers. So in a similar vein, somewhere lurking in relativity or in quantum physics is a fundamental uh, flaw, a fatal flaw, that uh, will end up taking away that aspect of that theory. But uh, this is about a much bigger viewing of brain-mind consciousness and acknowledging that no human has ever experienced anything other than the inside of their own consciousness. And therefore, it's incumbent on us to say much more about consciousness if we claim to have any understanding of the nature of reality. Oh, great stuff. I, and I just got this picture in my mind of a basketball going on, a game going on. And either you're on the court, you're experiencing it, or you're witnessing it in the stands. Right. And so I'm just thinking of us here on Earth, like we are on the court and we're getting so much more value than if we just read this in a book or uh, like if we didn't have this lifetime. Right. Oh, I would say that that is so true. And uh, really people are waking up to this tremendously, um, to this uh, kind of bigger worldview. Um, now, of course, it's... Uh, for those who were very comfortable flailing around in the shadow into the pool with their water wings, talking about being close to a theory of everything, we've now drifted over into the very deep end of the pool in this discussion and understanding of consciousness. And so they won't be as comfortable. And that's why they recoil so tremendously, uh, clinging to the false assumption of the physical is all there is and the brain creates consciousness, in spite of the fact that nobody has ever made any progress whatsoever along that uh, assumption pathway of thinking that the physical is all that exists and the brain creates consciousness out of physical matter. Uh, and that's where, of course, it gets very interesting. And it's through consciousness itself that we find this tremendous discussion can actually go somewhere. It's not a battle between science and spirituality. It's really, if anything, a conflict between those who want to believe in the simplicity of the supreme illusion that the material is all that exists, and those who investigate consciousness in the mind-body discussion who realize we must go much, much deeper. Because to simply try and explain consciousness out of pure physicalism 
uh, fails. It's a very challenging uh, uh, problem that uh, nobody's made any progress in to date. So it's really opening our minds to a much more uh, expansive view of the nature of reality that allows us to get to the next level. Mm. Dr. Alexander, a few people that I met uh, at the Omega Institute had met you, and they said, ask him about the third book he's writing. Would you be willing <laughs> to share? Well, it's one that I'm working on with, uh, with my uh, life partner in all this, uh, Karen Newell, who is the co-founder of uh, Sacred Acoustics. Uh, and we're very interested in trying to get it right because we don't feel, uh, for one thing, I've learned a tremendous amount about consciousness and basically our scientific paradigm and the emergent scientific paradigms over the last eight years since my coma. Uh, and so book three in many ways reflects a lot of that knowing and understanding. Plus, as I said, I've been meditating an hour to a day. I've done that for the last six years or so. Uh, and in that meditation, I often revisit the realms of my deep journey um, and, and come into much greater uh, learning from some of the guides and from that infinite power of unconditional love at the core of that journey that I can come and develop uh, an ongoing and improving relationship with in meditation. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I like to uh, share that meditation, why Karen and I travel around. But the third book is really trying to address all of these features in an appropriate form. And uh, it, the thing is that books like Proof of Heaven and Map of Heaven were not necessarily picked up by a major part of the target audience. I wrote both of those books for the uh, true open-minded skeptic. Yes. And in fact, when you really come to get the kind of knowledge that we'll be portraying in book three, which is a consolidation of all of this, you'll come to see that the first thing that a truly open-minded skeptic will reject are the simplistic falsehoods of conventional scientific materialism and especially brain creates consciousness. Because that one has so little to support it that you would throw it out almost instantly, except it's been adopted as kind of a foundational assumption. And that's what's given it such legs. It's, it's still around. It shocks me that the conventional scientific community could continue to fool people into pure belief in materialism well into the early 21st century. I mean, that kind of thinking should have died 100 years ago uh, with a, a more complete uh, assimilation of some of the uh, lessons of quantum physics and what it was trying to tell us about the primacy of consciousness. And yet, our scientific community uh, remains in the dark. Now, the good news is there are several physicists, Roger Penrose, Henry Stapp, uh, William Tiller, the engineer, uh, Amit Goswami, um, Claude Swanson. They're, they're physicists who get this, who kind of know that we must have a much richer understanding of, of consciousness. And so they do put it out there. But most of the world is not really aware of this. And so our book three is one that we look at as helping to bring the whole world up to speed on this, on the mind-body discussion, on the uh, measurement problem in quantum physics and what it's really trying to tell us about the nature of consciousness, and about how we can look at any of this uh, to make sense in our personal lives, uh, and to use this power of realizing that this consciousness is a mental construct and realize the power we have to actually manipulate and manifest the world of our dreams through having a deeper understanding of this nature of reality. Mm -hmm. And that's what book three, I hope, will help bring to this world, uh, is a very clear demonstration uh, of the value brought to the individual's life from coming to know this kind of uh, wow. impending synthesis of science and spirituality and deeper understanding of the mind-brain relationship and the nature of all reality, essentially. Wow. Dr. Alexander, it leaves me with a question. Ten years from now, or even for each of us that are gathering this information and embracing it now, how will this benefit our lives? How do you think, like if you were to fast forward even 20 years in the future that a world that really gets this stuff what kind of world would that be or even you know within my own lifetime that it will make I it will make a vast difference it'll be an unrecognizable world as we come to realize that we're all spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe and that 
the ultimate currency of that is unconditional love for ourselves and for all other aspects of the creation. The more we manifest forgiveness, acceptance, mercy, and compassion uh, for each other as the best way to show those very same qualities to ourselves, realize the oneness of all consciousness, uh, realize that any of the greed or selfishness, uh, pain or suffering we hand out to others in this life, if we don't make amends in this life, we must go through it in our life review, realizing that reincarnation is the order of the day. There's no way to deny the evidence supporting reincarnation, past life memories in children, more than 2,500 cases at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies alone in the books reported by Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker. Um, and realizing that it's a far bigger deal, this existence of ours, that we're far bigger players than just a little physical body, birth to death, nothing more, uh, everything will shift. Warfare, violence, all the conflict, every bit of it will disappear as we come to realize that we are part of one mind, that this is one consciousness, that unconditional love has infinite power to heal whether you're talking about healing the individual, healing the soul group, healing ethnic and national group, healing all of humanity, uh, it will all come from this awakening that is coming to us now. The damage done by pure scientific materialism and the assumptions it brought with it uh, and kind of the misinterpretation of uh, Darwinian evolution and this notion of competition and survival of the fittest uh, kind of missing the deeper point of what I think Darwin was really saying, what I think are uh, very fundamental uh, properties about biological systems and evolution. Uh, the more we come to get this bigger picture, the better this world will be. And each of us individually will. And everything you speak, that is the underlying purpose, is just a better life. And I always say play full out and get your money's worth out of life. I mean, this is your time. And it's interesting. Uh, I, I know our hours coming to an end but just for kicks you know i thought well this is episode 111 i wonder if there's any symbolic thing about the number 111 um and it actually said it's a number that encourages you encourages you to rely upon your inner wisdom and intuition to guide you absolutely it is a number that will help you bring out the best in yourself and further make progress down your life's path. I thought, now isn't that yeah, just that perfect? That sounds good to me. I'll go for that. Coincidence? Uh, I don't think so. There are no coincidences. No. There are no accidents. Every bit of this is for a purpose. And that's why it's so important for us to expand our field of view greatly beyond the false little boundaries of self and ego to uh, a far greater uh, awareness and consciousness that we're all in this together that all the various religious systems fundamentally agree. It's when we get into the down and dirty dogma, uh, you know, that moves far beyond the words of, of the prophets, uh, out into this kind of conflicting system that religious dogma often presents to us. Uh, that's where we get so confused. And that's, again, why getting, uh, you know, setting ourselves free from the shackles of the physical brain and the linguistic brain and the ego uh, but coming to a much greater wisdom by opening ourselves to the possibility that the brain is reducing valve or filter, allowing infinite universal consciousness in. Therefore, by going into our own consciousness, that's how we go out into the universe for a far deeper understanding. And the universe does not let us down. So I strongly support people who are not yet meditating. Get into it. Your life will absolutely improve. Your health will improve. Your relationships, your understanding of, of meaning and purpose in life, every bit of it uh, gets much more fertile and uh, robustly expressed through meditation. So a practice of daily meditation is my strongest recommendation. That's perfect. I was going to ask you for closing advice, and there you have it, meditation. And you had well, said oh, – go ahead. Yeah, just uh, wanted to say sure. – this really is all about coming to a much deeper knowing of oneness and that we are all part of that one mind. And, of course, in near-death experiences, people might experience that one mind as God, uh, you know, or Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh. I don't care what words you use. The words actually get in the way and the dogmatic uh, linguistic structures trying to uh, organize all that in, in some form down in this uh, lower four-dimensional space-time also gets in the way. So the answers lie within us all. Why not go within and find out for yourself?
Mm, that's beautiful. Beautiful closing words. Dr. Alexander, thank you so much for being our guest today. Well, Sandra, th- thanks so much for having me. I've, I've loved our conversation and hopefully we'll talk again sometime soon. We sure will. And for our listener, I want to really thank you for taking the time to listen. As a reminder, you can go to wedontdieradio.com, click on episode 111, and I have all the links to Dr. Eben Alexander's website, Eternia, Sacred Acoustics, some of the people that he's mentioned. I offer you can go to we don't die radio.com click on the insiders club if you want to read my book for free it's there as well as a very healing audio called how to survive grief and in closing my name is sandra champlain i have been your host on we don't die radio i believe with all of my heart that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important and just my final words uh it, it's taken from dr evan alexander's book and this is some words that were given to him by the woman on the on the butterfly wings you are loved and cherished dearly forever you have nothing to fear and there is nothing you can do wrong so all is well all the hardships and all the joys it's all well it's all perfect i want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon Mm -hmm.